right, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa. Excited about this uh, session today. Uh, we have uh, Ian Cheng joining us. And Ian's a, an artist known for his live simulations of virtual ecosystems uh, that help reveal how living agents uh, adapt to uh, change in chaotic environments. Some really cool stuff that, that he does. Uh, and he's the author of this really cool book, uh, which is the title of today's session, uh, Emissary's Guide to Worlding. And I don't have a, I guess a Kindle copy, so uh, it's on a Kindle. I definitely recommend checking it out. And um, the blurb, uh, uh, one of the blurbs is, uh, worlding is there's an unnatural art emerging right for our strange and complex time. And that is the art of worlding. And uh, that'll be the, the initial point of our inquiry today and how today is going to work. Um, I'm going to have an exchange uh, with Ian. He might share some, some of his screen, uh, some of the work that he does. And then uh, we'll pivot to Q&A. So if you have questions anytime, pop it in the chat. I'll call on you and you can ask your question uh, to Ian. Um, so that being said, Ian, welcome to STOA. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Um, excited to be here. Uh, I love some of the previous speakers you had uh, in your series. So um, yeah, super stoked to be here. And I think, uh, yeah, I, I did discover your work um, through Ribbon Farm, uh, Venkatesh Rao. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I finally, uh, read it this summer and I was like, ah, this is so stoa, <laughs> this, this type of session, the models and framing. Uh, and so I reached out to you because I thought it would be a benefit and service for people to getting exposed to your work. Um, and so I was sensing we could start with just level setting on some of the terms that you use in the book and, and so like, like world, worlding, artist mask. Um, so perhaps we could start with, with that, if you're, if you're cool, <clears throat> like what is a, what is a world? Yeah, sure. Uh, maybe just a really brief background. Um, I arrived to even writing that book and thinking about the idea of worlds uh, because maybe um, say since 2012, early 2013, uh, the primary thing I've been doing in my work as an artist is uh, making simulations um, using the Unity video game engine. And uh it all started really from just this idea that I really wanted to make artwork that felt alive, that had a kind of dyna uh, dynamic to it, um, and where I, as the artist, the author of the work, um, could be surprised by it. And of course, you know, artists have done this with you know living performers, with animals, uh, with you know plants. Uh, but I really wanted to do something digitally uh, where you know I could be much more fantastical, but still have that sense of aliveness that I was wasn't making an artwork that was um worked on to perfection and became this kind of static artifact but kept up being this dynamic system that i would be surprised with hopefully the viewer the audience of the artwork could find delight and surprise in it too uh emergent things could happen and so that was really the start of making simulations and then over time i realized that the thing that i became more interested in is something maybe a little bit abstracted from the kind of nuts and bolts of making a simulation, which is quite technical, um, as artistic as I want to make it, it is at the end of the day, kind of an engineering project. Um, I realized the thing, the artistic thing I was really interested in is making worlds. And so I kind of uh, was batting around that idea for a while uh, about what the difference was. Um, and uh, yeah, eventually I came, I kind of tried to sum up all my thoughts and like, uh, in a book. Um, initially, it was a, a book called Emissary's Guide to Worlding, which was a catalog made for um, this uh, institution in London called the Serpentine, uh, where I did a show. And my proposal to them was to not do an artist catalog, but to actually like um, use the artworks that I'd made as maybe a starting point to talk about this idea of worlding and what a world is. Um, because so much of maybe um, like the reviews and the kind of the curators who are asking me about my work, we're always talking about like world building. Um, and I was trying to think, what's the difference between world building and I feel like I'm doing something, or at least I'm trying to do something different by having this like living agency, trying to take care of it. Felt more like a gardener as an artist rather than like an architect, if, if that makes sense. And so what is this feeling of being this gardener? Um, and it's not exactly world building. And so, I mean, I think just to, talk about world building for a sec uh, uh, for any of you who like write fiction um i think world building is pretty self-evident it's sort of just you know making um or imagining the territory in which your story will eventually live in it's quite easy in a way to make a story set in i live in new york like set in new york in 2022 because 
the entire mental model I have for New York City is a given. It's just like I'm, I'm living and breathing it every day. So it's very easy for me to imagine a scene in a coffee shop in New York. Super easy. But, you know, if you have to imagine a scene in a, um, I don't know, an alien bar on some other planet and have to imagine all the details to even get to the point of writing a scene with um, any kind of dramatic potential in it. Well, you have to kind of fill in all the blanks there for what that culture is, what um Mm, unspoken assumptions there are and that I would say is world building right kind of making the territory um and that serves as a background for kind of often fiction um but I was thinking about worlding and what and what a world really is and I was thinking that a worlding is actually something much more about much closer to like um uh, almost like raising a pet or raising children it's uh, it's much more about creating something that's alive um and uh hmm, <clears throat> The simplest idea I have for what a world is, maybe is, we can get like into kind of the technicalities of this, but uh, I kept thinking it's sort of the dumbest analogy I had when I first started writing the book was, oh, I kept imagining, oh, a world is sort of like, it's sort of like when you see uh, these nature documentaries of a river forming and the river is sort of like the main spinal cord of, um, uh, of energy and of movement and of um, uh, nutrients moving. But then start around the river, like you know, a uh, little, uh, little plants and little like um, moss, and uh, eventually wildlife start to form around the river, and the river becomes not just a river; uh, it becomes a whole. Um, the river becomes a spinal cord, or almost a pretext for this other world to emerge around it, and the set of relations in uh, the plants and animals around it. So I started thinking of a definition of world, and it sounds kind of technical at first, um, but I started thinking that oh, the world is sort of like a, a web of relations. Um, I can think of it as a network or a graph um, that that flourishes around a repeatable game. In this river analogy, the repeatable game is the river keeps flowing, keeps pushing stuff down the thing, um, and that's a point of focus. And it's the pretext for all this other cool stuff to grow around it. Um, when I think about like, I don't know, uh, a new bar opening up in the Lower East Side where I live, like the game is the bar, right? Like the bar has to be sustainable, you know, it has to you know, make back its own money, has to like survive. And you know that the game there is you're going to go there, they're going to serve bever alcoholic beverages. Simple enough, right? We all can play that game. Everyone on both sides, the customer, the bartender, we all know what the roles are. And our sense of agency in that is already prescribed. Same with video games, right? When you play a video game, where your attention goes and where your agency goes is really relaxing because it's already describing where what your agency is because you have a role and what the where your attention should be. If it's like a sports game with a ball, like your attention should be on the ball. And there's something quite relaxing and deeply embedded into human civilizational in civilization to want to play games as a way of constraining attention uh, and constraining agency because within that constraint, you can actually find all these sort of subplots about yourself, about the game, about how you socialize with other people. And so this analogy of the bar is like you open up a bar. You don't want to just open a bar to make, you know, uh, to break even. You want to open up a bar to to create a scene, in a way, right? Like to kind of cultivate a, a, a kind of local culture around it, whether it ends up being a, a biker bar because like it ends up being on the side of a highway and a bunch of, you know, that's the that's the local population that ends up like wanting to use it there. It becomes like a, a bar for a particular, I don't know, where we size a lot of fashion stuff. Like, you know, people in fashion just chose your bar to meet up at um, and it just becomes that. I mean, whether you choose to accept what emerges around it or reject it, I mean, this is a point of maybe aesthetics of what you want the bar to be as the bar owner. But inevitably, if you allow it to just go, it's you kind of start to have a world. And so I kind of thought of a world more as like the cultivation, the kickstarting of, uh, of this kind of this world, how to cultivate it. And then eventually, you know, if a world is really sufficiently a world, you should be able to exit it. You should be able to leave and it should have enough um, flourishing interrelationships that are valuable to people who are already in it, uh, that it can kind of keep itself going without you as the original author. And for me, this was an important idea because I was thinking so much about my simulations, um, the people who, uh, where it's exhibited, um, um, some collectors who own it, the perpetual problem for me, uh, which uh, is like, oh, Ian, you know, can I knock on your door in 10 years if we have a pro technical problem with the simulation, if I have to like, if we need it serviced, if we need some update, we need a patch for new, like, you know, uh, operating system. And as an artist, like, um, 
Like, I hate this idea. It's my responsibility, of course, but I also want some sunset clause on like my own responsibility for it. So I always start, start thinking about the world, like the most successful worlds to me are the ones where either the founder dies, has to exit, and yet it still keeps going. And maybe it's character or it's spirit changes a little bit. Um, but if it stays alive, uh, I mean, I guess if it stays alive, it necessarily has to change its spirit a little bit, like kind of like a company that has a new CEO. Um, but uh, yeah, so I started thinking about this and um, how to keep a world alive is its own like, um, is its own like end game that I personally don't have much experience with. Um, um, but um, yeah, maybe we'll start there. And what's coming up, uh, and I know you mentioned this in the book, uh, you know, James Carr's Finite Infinite Games uh, and people at the store are probably well familiar with those terms. How does that map over and relate to uh, a world like how does a uh, Carson's version of a game whether find an infinite infinite map over to uh, your concept of a world yeah this is such an influential book uh, find our infinite games I mean my takeaway from reading it uh was that um like find in infinite games are quite hard to actually achieve it's sort of an ideal that we grasp for but maybe the only true I think he even says at the end the only true infinite game is like nature itself in a way um, and that we, we as human beings are, of course, constructing finite games all the time, and of course can find ourselves trapped in them. What I think is maybe the compromise is a finite games that you can iterate, you know, like that you can play iteratively, that you can keep playing. And it's like, you know, um, maybe like a chess game is very finite, um, but if you are a chess player and you're playing it every day, you're playing the same finite game repeatedly, um, well, a kind of ethic emerges across iterated games, right? Like we have to kind of be a good player. Um, I started doing jujitsu recently and it's like, if you're an asshole in jujitsu at the jujitsu studio, like no one wants to spar with you. Uh, and you're probably gonna get ejected from the, the metagame of just being there to play the game. Uh, every jujitsu jiu like uh, role in match uh, sparring is very finite uh, with very clear win conditions and lose conditions. Um, but because it's iterative, it's very, it's the ethic of the overall spirit and sport of jujitsu is uh, very humbling and not actually about winning, even though win states define the finite game and of course define jujitsu when you're in competition. It's really about channeling the spirit of jujitsu and using the, the tight constraints of the finite game to kind of um, understand your body more, be more, um, uh, embed more kind of knowledge in your body, uh, kind of more non-propositional knowledge in your body. And um, it's kind of in the iteration of finite games where I think you can kind of um, grope or reach for uh, an infinite, in, kind of a sense of an infinite game. And, and is it like a, like a world of something that gives birth to an infinite game? Uh, would you for example, I, th I think if a, a world that can actually keep going, yeah, I, it, the ideal I think of any world is um, that it keep that it at least lives its full lifetime uh, without your adult parental supervision. Uh, again, I think of it in terms of like pets or children, like, you know, you want to cultivate as a parent, I'm a parent of two kids now. And like, as a parent, I want to like, <clears throat> of course, shape their reality, like shepherd, um, shepherd them. But at a certain point, I know myself, they have to go away and I have to also equally like let go. And uh, the success of a world is that you can let go and it can autonomously, you know, go on its, on its own. Of course, a world can also and should maybe necessarily some world should die, you know, like not all worlds don't have to live forever. Infinite games doesn't mean like infinite time. I think it means more that it has just the potential to keep going. Uh, what's the definition? Like it's the infinite game is a game where that you play with only rules that mm, maybe you have to change the rules to keep it going. Um, and that strikes me uh, in, a, in a smaller infinite way, like that's the potential of a child, right? Like we all Everyone loves children and we put so much value on children because, um, you know, they have the potential to really surprise us and their life, their life path will definitely surprise us. Um, they should keep going without, you know, our scripting imposed onto them, our meaning adults. Um, yeah, yeah. I say like we had a Timothy Morton's hyper object on recently and it's kind of mapping over uh, like this world is like a hyper object that like it lives and it could die. Um, and and you, you talked about like all these cool concepts like uh, um, 
you know, craters hold and the artist mass I want to get to, but perhaps the ground people, if you had some examples on what a world is, um, like famous examples in, in, in culture, um, could we go through some of those? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, I keep thinking of like, just like the most local things that are around me in my life right now. Like, so I started to, like, I started jujitsu recently and it's like this little studio in the basement, two blocks from my house. It's run by like a black belt in jujitsu and a black belt in Muay Thai. And, you know, they, they started the studio to train people to just in a pragmatic way in the art of one, self-defense, like that's one game, uh, two, like competition jujitsu. Um, it's like the kind of the sport of it. Um, and that's that's the game. That's what you pay membership for ostensibly to learn that stuff. And you just go into class and maybe you kind of level up over time to like from white belt to blue to purple to whatever, to, to brown to black. And it's a very clear game. It's all martial arts studios basically have the same premise as a game. Uh, and you, but built into it, quite elegantly is you have to keep going because it's such a body thing uh, and you have to learn it in your body. The body is like the reinforcement learning machine, right? Like you have to do things repeatedly in your body to learn things, new physical skills. Like when you're riding a bike, uh, learning to, I don't know, ski, play a sport, you got to just do it repeatedly. You can't like knowledge, you can't like outsmart your way through uh, learning things in your body. And so it's quite, it's quite elegant. Um, mm, it's quite an elegant situation where in a martial arts studio, you just have to show up and you have to be a total idiot and loser, clumsy person day in, day out in order to like embed this stuff in your body. You can't just know it. Um, you can't just Wikipedia. It. And so you have to show up and that's the game. It's a repeatable game. Um, but of course, what naturally emerges is there's like little cliques that emerges. Some people have closer relationships with um the teacher than others um some people fall in love uh there's definitely people just hanging out on the in-between moments of classes just because at a certain point they just enjoy each other's company or maybe that's the only place they have outside of their work um to kind of uh i don't know be someone to find their identity um there's so many ulterior motives and i think that's the key of a world is that ideally it can support all these ulterior needs that people have um, under the pretext of this, this game. Um, and the pretext isn't just a pretext. It's something you should like in jujitsu, everyone is motivated to be there. You have to have this demon energy inside you to even show up. It's almost tricking yourself. So the game is actually a trick for yourself because you want to do the game because it's interesting to you just as a baseline. I like this game. And then all the side effects of just showing up um begin to emerge and so it, it's quite painless uh, it's not effortful for you to participate in the world and how these other often social needs met um uh within the the the, the, the game of this jujitsu studio um all the while you're learning the skill you know you feel like you're leveling up over time if you're committed to it so you have a sense of progress um i mean Tons of neurological studies show that you know progress is the surest sign of um, you know positive emotion, uh, forward progress towards a goal. And so, in a martial arts studio, they deliberately you know there's, there's the belt goal. There's just simply how you perform on any given in any given session, how well you do with your sparring partner, uh, all the mistakes you make, the mistakes that you no longer make. You sense yourself, and the partner that you encounter is often a partner because you're show, showing up to essentially a social scene now, someone who you've already encountered before. And often they will remark, oh, like you got better or like, oh, that's cool how you did that there. Or like, oh, you're still making that mistake. Um, and so uh, you have this feedback reinforcement loop that's already built into the culture of this particular sport. And so this becomes such a, yeah, this becomes, I think it's just a kind of self-fulfilling world. If these instructors, if the teachers left, I'm dead certain everyone there who's like showing up will find either another jujitsu studio to like coagulate around or like start to do it themselves or you know look for a replacement teacher you know like it's it's in a way like it's the the spirit of the game itself and the all the side effects the subplots that emerge around it are strong enough to keep the world going mm -hmm. um and uh we got some questions in the chat already and we're gonna pivot that in a moment but i wanted to share um sort of like a really psychoactive aspect of the the book this uh two by two um of the four different types of artists and on the oh, yeah. 
y axis is the um steering by stories and then steering by gut and then on the x axis is seeking home versus seeking surprise um and then you got a cartoonist director uh emissary and hacker so you can kind of like pause this if you're watching on youtube and, and, and read a little bit about it um but this the title of the session is like art of worlding right like the, the art form of it and uh the emissary and portal art seems to be the thing there so um yeah before we pivot the q a is there anything you want to share here to set the the frame in the question space yeah so i mean um you know part of the when i was trying to think about worlds and worlding um you know we've been talking about it in a kind of externalized way but of course so much if you want to be the creator of the world um i mean this is maybe the key thanks for bringing this up if you want to be the creator of the world um i had to think about the inner psychology of what that means to be the creator of a world and um it led me to this feeling that as an artist um, even before thinking about worlding, I realized there's different parts of me that emerge that are sometimes effective and sometimes really ineffective when I'm embarking on a creative project, whether it's a writing project or an artistic project. Um, actually, if you don't mind, can you keep up that slide? Um, I'd love to just like look at it. Um, and uh, I ended up realizing that one way to conceptualize the different parts of me that have to kind of show up at different times when I'm working on let's say an artwork, uh, are these different, I call them masks, or you can maybe think of them as like demons or kind of sub-personalities. Um, they, the director, <clears throat> the cartoonist, the hacker, and the emissary, they all kind of have to show up at a certain point. Um, the most important one, I think, for the case of worlding is, um, well, maybe I'll just go through a little bit. Uh, like when I was making these simulations, the first one that always showed up for me was, in my case, the hacker. You know, I was, when I even just start the idea of simulations, I was like, oh, I'm going to, this is 2012, I'm going to like take a video game engine, I'm not going to make video games, I'm going to make a video game that plays itself, you know, like, I'm going to kind of like mm, flip the bid on what it means to you even use this tool. Um, I'm going to tinker around with all the tools available within it, I'm going to write my own tools. Um, and on top of that, I, I was kind of in the context of the art world, like, I thought, oh, this is a niche, like a kind of a very specific thing that, I don't know, it kind of untapped. No one else really has approached um, making art in this way and definitely not in a kind of professional art context. And no one else has like tried to package it in a way that would be legible to someone who doesn't care about any of simulation or um, you know, video games or programming, someone who doesn't care about any of that. How could I like hack my way into that? And so that's always where I started uh, with the simulations. And then this thought of like how to, um, um, is that essentially make it legible to a broader audience, to uh, gallerists, uh, to curators, to other artists um, about what I was doing without being just like a technical art project, like um, uh, uh, was, was kind of involved this, what I call the cartoonist, this archetype, um, really trying to hone in on like um, an emotional through line. Maybe there's a character in the simulation. Um, maybe there's a problem that we're very familiar with um, that could, of course, easily be staged in maybe like writing or a drama. But I'm staging in a simulation, but I'm still marrying this new thing that's a simula simulation with like, I don't know, a coming of age drama, uh, like with a character or like even just like a little pet. Um, uh, I made this project called Bob, which was like a, an autonomous AI agent. But it had to, Bob had to have a kind of cute face and a kind of cartoony, almost a Miyazaki-like creature look. And for me, this is the cartoonist coming out. It's really this thing that is the interface to just um, the most common denominator in everyone's brain. I mean, so much of making art for me, I realized, is making a neural bridge from myself to the viewer. And the prosthetic is the artwork. Um, but really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to talk, use the artwork to talk to a certain part of the viewer's brain. Um, my favorite movies, my favorite artworks, you can clearly feel like, like with Miyazaki, I love Miyazaki's movies because you feel the age group that he's talking to, which is a literal demographic, like he's talking to children, like Totoro is for kids, no question. But he's also talking to the kid inside of me. Um, and I asked someone in Japan, when I did a show in Japan once, like, what does Miyazaki mean here? And the person was like, oh, he's a really grumpy guy, like, but love him or hate him. Everyone in Japan grows up with Totoro across generations. And how crazy is that to make an artwork where you're essentially incepting some pattern of um, 
well, there's a kind of morality of Totoro, a kind of aesthetic, a kind of um, vibe. Um, you're incepting all of that into every generation of child because that is the media that they watch at that impressionable age. Um, and so I realized like also when I'm a cartoonist, I'm trying to also consider very strongly who the audience is in terms of, um, age is maybe the wrong word. I'm trying to um, consider who the audience is in terms of, uh, yeah, uh, psychological development, like where a person, what part of a person's psychology um, uh, am I talking to? Um, so often I think now we see in art, um, artwork that is, um, especially really pol overtly political artwork, it's really talking to uh, like a more adult or um, actually a more kind of parental kind of ego state in a person's brain. And, you know, the parent ego state, this is an Eric Byrne idea, uh, comes from also from Freud, you can think of it as a super ego. Um, the parent ego state is just like, it's, it's the part of you that's very automatic. It's kind of received recorded wis wisdom from the culture uh, imparted to you by probably your own parents or early authority figures. Um, and it's just a knee-jerk reaction to kind of constraining chaos, constraining entropy. And it's often outdated with our current really um, weird changing environment. And so often when I see political artwork, I think, oh, this artwork, whatever I believe, whether I agree with it or not, like, oh, it's just talking to the parent inside of me. And mm, it's not that interesting as an artwork. Uh, whereas what I love about Miyazaki is it's talking to um, different movies of his, talk to different as different. Um, parts of my childhood. Totoro talks to like maybe like my five-year-old, uh, like Princess Mononoke talks to like um, some rebellious teenage part of me, like um, Howl's Moving Castle talks to like some more like romantic young, younger 20s part of me. Um, but they all talk to like the child in me. And so, so much of the cartoonist I think is just kind of dealing with this, you know, pop psychology side of making, uh, which is I think extremely essential and totally not superficial in terms of making art because art in the end of the day is a form of uh, <laughs> unabridged communication. You know, if we could say it in words, we would, but sometimes we can't uh, say or think in words. We have to kind of make art about it and kind of um, um, make art to even understand the world we live in. And so it has to be this multi-sensory, uh, bridge between the artist and the viewer and so the cartoonist for me is always very essential i almost like think too much about the cartoonist domain okay maybe just to be brief um the director that archetype i think of it as just basically the maybe the adult inside of me just the, the overall planner like here are the deadlines it's sort of like director of a movie you know you're actually just kind of like the general of an army um even if it's just the army of you even if you're just the general of these other um, parts of you um, and so I think of the director as the person who has like some macro vision uh, of what this thing is supposed to mean um, and how to organize that. I mean, kind of procedural in a way, like pretty uh, boring, but completely essential, uh, especially uh, more recently, I've been doing simulations and uh, made this anime like film in the Unity video game engine called Life After Bob. And it's really like the complexity of the organization to even achieve that project and make a more complex artwork, you kind of have to just start to get organized. Um, so those three masks, I think, are probably most common. I think most people in the creative world um, encounter them in themselves. And then finally, when I was writing this book, I just thought, oh, there's there's a missing quadrant here. There's something else here. And that's for me what I call the emissary. And it's maybe the, the easiest analogy is sort of like a gardener. Uh, it's the person who has to kind of maintain or take care uh, uh, of a project, especially once it's started or once it's even launched. In my case, with these simulations, there was no, um, you know, things always emerged after I initially launched the project or started the project. It, they, they were never complete in the same way that software, the analogy of software is a good analogy to the kind of art I make. You know, classical, classically, if you make painting or sculpture, you kind of have a finish line. A painting's done or a sculpture's done at some point. Uh, whether that takes 10 years or 10 months or 10 days, you're, you're going to kind of finish it and be done with it. Um, but so much of creating complex systems as the baseline for the artwork that I make is essentially software. And the analogies in software are much more emissary-like. They're not finite. They're actually quite infinite. So like, you know, when you release software, you're releasing your alpha and then you're releasing tons of bug and patch fixes. And then you're, of course, releasing features that are in dialogue or response to the response that you're getting from the viewer, from your users. Uh, and you're, um, of course, not letting the user totally dictate where you're going, but you're also definitely adjusting to real time how people are reacting to this dynamic system that you've made. How useful is it? 
how, how much better could the UI be? How can you make it more comfortable? What features are so obvious that you would have never seen from the inception of the project, but are so clear once people are using it. And so I think of the emissary as really this sort of caretaker that kind of comes in after you're no longer incubating um, a project and you finally shown it to people, people are interacting with it if it's actually software or people are just engaging with it if it's a work of art. And then you're kind of iterating and um, trying to give it life and health and an ongoing spirit once it's already launched. And this is a very different mindset. I've learned this most recently. I released an NFT project. And for those of you who are interested in any of that, what's so funny about the culture of NFTs is when you launch an NFT project, <clears throat> the people who end up uh, collecting your NFTs really want the emissary in you to come out. They want to know like, how are you going to support the project next? What's the next feature? What's the roadmap? Um, what uh, what uh, advantages or utility or uh, special like gifts will you give me if I hold on to this NFT? It becomes like some weird hybrid version of like uh, a stockholders meeting when you do a Discord with people who hold your NFT, uh, which is which is amazing as an artist. It's an engagement with the viewer that an intimate engagement with the viewer that I've never experienced before. So it's, it's, uh, I don't mean any cynicism by it. It's very interesting, but it calls upon me, the emissary. And this is something that as much as I've written about it and as much as I've named projects out there, the emissary like, is the least developed part of me that I'm um, learning, you know, I'm driving a car and building at the same time. I'm learning as I go here. And so for me, I thought this is quite a new part of the creative process um, because it's a new way of making art, right? It only really has an opportunity to emerge when you make art that has an ongoing nature to it. Uh, when you finish your artwork, if it's a finite artwork, you really don't have to count on the emissary for anything. So it's kind of an unpracticed part, at least in creative making, uh, art, art making. Maybe it's something that comes out in like, I don't know, maintaining your, your home or your family or things like this, or maintaining a pet. Um, but in terms of creative process, I think it's a kind of a new thing. Maybe the last thing I want to say is like, I wrote about this inner part of, how you as an individual uh, artist can make a world because I thought maybe right around the time I wrote it, which was, um, let me see, it must've been 2018. Um, I wrote an, uh, a kind of updated ebook version in 2019. Um, I think I wrote it because I sensed that it was on the horizon that an individual could make a world. We think of worlds as giant institutions of, you know, like a school's a world, a bar's a world. It can be an entrepreneur, but then you need like a business partner and it becomes this big, massive thing, uh, or kind of a group, um, how do you say, a shared enterprise with other stakeholders quite quickly. But I thought, oh, maybe now an artist can make a world, an individual artist, you could start to, you could spin up a world. And I think, um, for better or worse, we're most acutely seeing this in, for example, like the NFT world where like a couple guys, uh, an individual, a single person can just like create an NFT project. And suddenly, if it's interesting enough, if that simple game is interesting enough, suddenly their Discord is populated with tons of people. Um, people are talking about it um, and a whole world emerges around it. And in a sense, you could say a most generous reading of NFT projects right now uh, is like the NFT is sort of like sort of like the tree in the forest. It's the tree, but the real artwork is the network that gets created. It's the world that gets created. And in a way, the artists uh, making NFT projects, if I'm very generous about this idea, is uh, that their the, their medium is the, the network, the, the kind of the social graph that gets uh, that emerges from it and kind of maintaining that social graph and shaping it aesthetically uh, um, um, through the concrete mechanisms of the NFT and the kind of um, the, actual, the artwork around it. But the artwork itself is probably the network, um, or I think that's what it will emerge to. Um, I think there are other ways that uh, worlds emerge um, that we all know about, but to me, that's the most exciting thing is about the idea of an individual being able to make a world almost instantaneously overnight uh, and have it be an interesting enough and habitable place by other people. Um, maybe dies really quickly too, as we're seeing a lot in the crypto world. Um, but yeah, I think now for more, it's just it's an instinct. It's got feeling now more than ever, like worlds can just kind of be created speedily. And there's something to be said about speed. Ideas can be old, but if they can be um, executed quickly, a whole other dynamic emerges. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing. Yeah, um, I like that. And um if the people in the, the Zoom right now here at the STOA, uh, if any one of these worlds resonate with you or show up often, uh, put in the chat which one 
resonates with you most and maybe what area in your life uh, i'm curious to to see that and um yeah the this has been quite psychoactive for me and helpful for me like uh, i view the stoa as like an artwork and i call myself the steward here which i guess is akin to like a gardener um and it's that that notion of uh and i really appreciate what you just said like it's one thing uh like inviting a model in that just kind of nails like a, a a role that needs to uh be people need to be more aware of so the other thing being skilled at this at this function at the emissary uh role um and well, let me uh, just add to that it's funny you bring that up you, you just make you make a good point the stoa is of course yeah you're the game is of course you know you're you invite someone um and then they do this talk but of course the meta game the world that you've made is this right and people show up in a way of perhaps for the individual like conversation that you're now like about to host but really it's for the kind of vibe that you've created across individual games you've played with uh the people you've you, you've spoken to and interviewed i think of the same way as people who are podcast hosts right like the game is so brutally simple right like you're hosting po everyone has their own podcast now uh and you just kind of record some stuff um but the ones that are that are worlds the ones that we're all attracted to are the ones where a world has emerged around it a certain aesthetic has emerged around it by aesthetic i mean something actually very specific it's like aesthetic is sort of, I mean, it's sort of a dumb way of thinking about it. i think of aesthetics as like it's sort of like what you love, right? Like it's like the things that you're allowed, you're allowing in and things that are allowing out. It's a kind of a boundary condition, right? Like, um, and everyone has an aesthetic. You're no one can universally let everything in, and no one is so closed-minded that they like shut everything out and wither away. Um, so everyone has aesthetic, especially if you in creative endeavors, like you let things in, you let things out, and the nature of what you let in and what you let out, that's what I mean by aesthetic. Um and that's a necessary thing to have to grapple with when you're making a podcast, when you're making uh, an interview like series like this. Um, and so, yeah, social media, for better or worse, has created a lot of emissaries, uh, podcast hosts, influencers, people who, you know, have an active Twitter account, after an active Twitter identity, an active Instagram identity, an active TikTok identity. The media game is just posting. Um, um, but, you know, the ones that we're attracted to start to create a kind of world around them. Yeah, and I think at the the edge with a lot of the emissaries out there is um, the the creators hold, you know how to how to release that wisely, um, and it's kind of like one thing. It's like it's like boundary work with vibes. That's that's one of the roles of like the gardener, or the steward. Um, but then how do you uh, release it? And that's at my edge, and it seems like that's uh, uh, at your edge as well. Um, but let's pivot to a Q and A, uh, and so we have uh, some questions in the chat. Uh, Nathan, did you want to um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'll change my question up a little bit. I'm just curious to get your take <laughs> on how you see AI as a supplement to world building and how you see that affecting maybe agency as an artist and in, as a human. How do you see that affecting world building? Yeah, I think uh, all the advances we've seen in AI is a it's a it's a bit like crypto. It's an accelerating tool to make it so that an individual can spin up a world that is um, expansive and deep and fertile much faster. You know, um, with all these image diffusion tools. Uh, I mean, I don't have a specific example. I mean, the way in which I can just speak personally, the way in which I've a, a grapple with and use AI in my own work is very different from the AI that we hear about um, uh, on the in the news, all these diffusion models and stuff, which I think is super interesting. We can talk about that. The stuff that I've been using in my simulations is much more of a uh, an AI agent based approach. Um, so when you have to make an AI agent, um, you have to deal with um, the survival of the agent, how the agent negotiates um, some future expectations with its current um, situation, which is its current uh, virtual embodied situation. You know, all the agents have a virtual body. And so it's a very different kind of AI that I've been mostly engaged with. Um, but all these new AI tools, you know, just to think about this for a second, you know, uh, for all of you who've seen like all the stuff with stable diffusion, the sooner that stable diffusion, you know, this kind of um, text to image, um, becomes real time, like 24 frames a second. You don't have to wait 30 seconds to get your image back. Oh man, I mean, forget like making art out of it. Like just imagine the future of um, Zoom or chat or any kind of communication medium. We communicate in text and voice and in video right now, but imagine being able to like 
essentially like I'm, I want to share a thought with you. I kind of become a master at crafting thought in the language of these diffusion models and literally like autocomplete as I'm typing, it's rediffusing it into like the thing that I'm closer to the thing I want to share with you. And I share it with you, maybe you're even experiencing what I'm writing, uh, generating at the same time as it's generating it and using it too. And it becomes closer to telepathy or a, a richer visual language rather than a textual language that we can commun communicate with. This is crazy. I mean, this to me is just like I mean, every sci-fi author's dream. It's definitely every child's dream. Like you just communicate with the full dimensionality of thought, which is visual, which is um, auditory, which is linguistic. It's all those things combined into kind of dream medium. And I can just see like a future mm, tech communication platform where diffusion is like the medium itself. You're just going back and forth, creating these, um, I don't know what to call them, mm, these kind of uh, this a visual language, a uh, dream language. And you don't have to be like literally telepathically hooked up to each other. Its expressivity is so fluid um, that it's basically as fast as you can type or speak. Um, and that's 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 pretty good. Um, and maybe there's one other point I would want to just point out is like, I, I forgot who said it. Maybe it was, I don't remember who said it, but someone's pointing out like what these models really mean. I I knew intuitively what they meant, but it was so beautiful that I wanted to share it if I can summarize it. Like, you know, previous uh, paradigms of computing were always about solving, making functions to solve discrete solutions. Like you make a function and it poops out like a, a very definite answer. What's so beautiful about deep learning, especially in the visual arts, especially with these images, is that you're creating a paradigm of programming where the function poops out a, uh, a continuous set of solutions, literally a gradient of solutions. And as you shift your inputs, you get, you get answers in the neighborhood of that thing to almost an endless variety. And this is a very new paradigm, just on a technical level of programming. You're not programming for finite answers anymore. You can, you're programming for uh, a latent space, a gradient of answers, a, cont a continuity of answers. Uh, this is like, um, I mean, there's a difference between algebra and calculus, right? Like in calculus, you're dealing with change and continuities. Uh, and deltas in classic, you know, in, in like algebra, you're just dealing with, you know, you, you solve for X and you get X. And this is a huge paradigm shift. Uh, and then to appreciate it on a mathematical level made it really clear to me. Um, yeah, I just want to share that because I thought it was such a cool insight. But the reason why I'm saying that is that lends itself to communication because we all want to communicate expressively. And expression is by nature a continuous space. It's not a finite space. I mean, of course, we want to all say the perfect uh, phrase something the most in the most perfect definition or the perfect tweet, but we all value, you know, how we would all say, talk about the same thing in slightly different ways. And that's a continuity or how I would say the same thing, the same idea in a slightly different way for my own, you know, uh, for my own sense of variety, for my own just kind of where maybe I had less coffee today than like I normally do. So it's going to change a little bit. And so the fact that we could, we're on the verge of having a visual language that supports in its bones this continuity of expression, that, that's what's gonna make it so expressive as a medium in the future, in, in the very, very, very near, near future. And I think this is just so cool. Um, so whether that leads to worlds or not, it'll definitely lead to like whatever the next, I don't know, Zoom or WhatsApp or um, yeah, um, messaging platform those, that, that will emerge on top of all the art that will emerge too. Um, I think it'll change the way we communicate. Awesome. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, Greg, uh, Henricus, you had a your hand up. Yeah, first, thanks so much um, for a wonderful and stimulating uh, presentation. Uh, got me thinking about a wide variety of different uh, elements. I'm a psychologist, and so uh, I found your two by two really interesting. Um, in fact, I work, you know, you may know John Verbeke. I immediately sort of saw, oh, his kind of uh, uh, recursive relevance realization is about exploration and conservation. So essentially mm. surprise and homing. I emphasize uh, our person narrative and our primate gut, as it were. So you can immediately see that. And I'm just curious then, uh, where was that just sort of an inspiration? Were you building off of anything? Um, where are you kind of in that model and kind of how you ground that? Because it looked uh, genuinely fascinating and it afforded me uh, lots of different kind of resonances. So I deeply appreciated that. Oh, thank you. It's great to hear. Um, yeah, I mean, it came from my own experience being an artist, and um, I was just thinking, yeah, what are the axes to define these kind of archetypes? 
and what they have in common. I had the archetypes before I even had the axes in a way. And so I kind of fitted the axes to uh, understand, just to kind of understand the placement of the archetypes. Um, but yeah, steering by gut and steering by story. I mean, um, you know, I was writing that around the same time I started to write this anime series called Life After Bob. And it's literally, I mean, quite literally thinking about story and about the long-term arcs of characters. And, um, and then simultaneously, you know, so many decisions I make as an artist <clears throat> are very much in the present, are very much uh, by some non-propositional just gut feeling, something that's just accumulated in my bones and my muscle memory and my um, just unconscious aesthetic. Um, and so I just thought those would be natural axes. Um, it's a very dumb answer in a way, but they just kind of came from my, just my own experience. And then maybe the more, and then this, the, the seeking home and seeking frontier. Um, I don't know, this is just a very basic boundary condition. I think of, uh, um, since I was, since I was a kid, you know, like, um, it, my, I'm blessed with parents who don't call me that much. You know, like they really just don't call me. I have to call them. Most people I know, their parents, like most people my age, their parents like call them. And in a way they call them to of course be connected to them. But I always saw it as a way to, to drag them back to an early state, earlier state of development and to just kind of LARP being a child again so that they can be more fully a parent again. As a new, as a new parent, I can fully see myself becoming guilty of that. So my kids get older and I'm already trying to fight the instinct to do that. And so I just thought, oh, I'm blessed with like parents who don't call me that much. Literally, they don't do not pick up the, they do not um, call me. And so um, I felt so much, you know, moving to New York, trying, pursuing being an artist, being an artist in using digital simulation, you know, no Asian parents can say that that's the recipe for success. And so, but they never, because they don't call me, they don't know like what I'm really up to until I just report back to them. And so I just thought, oh, I'm, I'm, I can go onto the frontier and that's something that maybe is already in my script because of their hands-off approach that I'm just allowed to just wander off. You know, my parents are always, one parent was always working overseas in Asia when I was a kid. I grew up in LA and the other parent was working. So I'd like come home alone and like do my homework, like, you know, like make, sometimes even make dinner myself. So I was very independent. I'm an only child. And so seeking frontier just seemed like something I kind of want to do. Um, of course, you can take that also, like just, you know, seeking risk and seeking that. I don't want to frame it as honorable as like, oh, I'm a risk taker. I'm just like, I don't know. I'm just kind of going out there, seeing what's out there. I wouldn't call that risk, though. I mean, some people might do that. Uh, and then seeking home, I think of as all the parent people I know who like, uh, you know, for whatever, better or worse, something inside them is programmed to want to mm, A, seek comfort or at least refine things that already exist, which is a form of comfort and is a completely valid form of comfort. You know, when you think of every Oscar winning movie, there is sort of a mm, unspoken formula of to like winning an Oscar. And if you're the kind of filmmaker who kind of graduates from film school and you want to like go down the path of making like uh, like an honorable Oscar movie, like, you know, you, you kind of have a range of subject matter to work with. You kind of have a style to work with. You kind of have a gravitas or seriousness that you kind of have to live within. And you can refine that, you know, like there's always space for refinement, um, but it's not, it's not seeking a frontier and it's not, um, yeah, it's, uh, I guess, yeah, it's the opposite of refinement. And so, yeah, I just thought those were kind of natural axes that sort of fit these different artistic um, archetypes. And I think we're all, um, you know, we all, we have, we have all of them inside of us, um, but what balance you in which you play, play with them and what balance in which they naturally emerge from you. Like, I think that's all to do with like, yeah, how, like how you've been raised, your life experiences and how conscious you are of them right now. That's beautiful. Uh, I don't think it's a dumb answer at all. I, I think you're just, you're hitting on some of the core axes uh, of human oh, psychology. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm so glad. That's really oh, good. cool. <laughs> cool. Cool. Thanks, Greg. Um, Christian, uh, you had a, a question. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, Ian, and I, I love the, the BJJ analogies. And, you know, what's amazing about BJJ, right, is there's feedback, you know what you're practicing, you're doing submissions, you're taking the back, right, you're doing takedowns. When you think about the masks, what is a good way to, you know, become more skillful there and practice it? And then, you know, uh, I, I think I'm stuck in the director a lot. So, you know, not getting stuck in different masks. Thanks. <clears throat> Well, I think if you're stuck in the director a lot, you probably don't have to consciously think too much about that one anymore. Um, it'll just, that's maybe you're just like your home state. Um, you know, I would say the cartoonist is probably the most approachable and the funnest one to like toy around with. It's like, <clears throat> I mean, 
you could be very cynical about it and you could read books about persuasion or, you know, like, you know, people don't, people aren't meritocratic, people aren't rational, they go by their emotion, like all this kind of stuff. And that's definitely fair game for the cartoonist. Uh, maybe a more um, benevolent and generous approach is this thing I was talking about Miyazaki, which is a more re recent realization because I've had to watch so many Miyazaki films recently because of my kids. Uh, I think I've watched Totoro like 50 times now, I've watched Howl's Moving Castle like probably 30 times now since my daughter's new favorite movie. Ponyo I've seen like, I don't know, maybe 12, 16 times, tons. So I'm just like steeped in Miyazaki, not by choice, but um, this thing about an artwork um, targeting at you as the author, targeting a part, a part of a person. I always find that when I walk into an exhibition or I read a book or I watch a movie and you feel like it's trying to talk to too many parts of you or it's unclear what part of you it's talking to, it feels like, like I, you don't want to be there. It's again, an artwork is a game too. And as we we're talking about before, a game is a way of constraining, telling you what to care about, like where your attention should go. You can relax with an artwork because it's telling you where your attention should be. And that's a that's a blessing. You want to see art that where you don't have to like, guess where your attention needs to be. I mean, some artwork is deliberately, um, mm, maybe some artworks are deliberately trying to probe that, but most artworks, you're trying to get to something else. And so you, you tell the, the audience what the game is, you know, whether that's in the subject matter or the framing of the room that you're in, um, you tell them what game you're playing. And I think that for me is such an important aspect of being an artist. And when I framed it that way for myself, like it's quite easy to be a cartoonist because that's something I think we should all care about if you're making artwork, if you're writing something. Um, you have to know who you're, it's a stupid thing to say, but you have to elite, not know who your audience will be because maybe you know something will emerge, but who your audience is. And the audience isn't actually a person. I think it's a psychological state inside a person. Uh, a pattern of behavior and specifically, especially with movies uh, or media, it's a it's an age group usually uh, that's still, of course, dormant inside of you. I mean, I think about, I was thinking about the other day, I was on a plane, I was just browsing through all the movies on Delta and they had like 80, 90 movies. I'd seen like maybe 30 of them. And I just not, I for the first time in my life, I was like not compelled to watch a movie on the plane, not even rewatch a movie I loved. And I was like, oh, I mean, I'm 38 years old. Like maybe at a certain point, you don't need movies anymore. I mean, I would I, I, there are movies I will absolutely watch because it tickles some part of me uh, or out of support for someone or just out of like, mm, like kind of a vague interest. Um, but I think the, the adult in me does not need movies. However, the child in me totally needs movies. And, um, you know, I will watch the new, like the Dune part two um, because it, it, it attacks a child in me. You know, I read the book, you know, I love the world, you know, so much of Star Wars is influenced by Dune. I love Star Wars as a kid. And so it attacks the child in me, uh, but there's, I don't know, 90% of Netflix movies. They're just, they don't, they don't talk to that part of me. So they're, they're just not for me. That's not to say they're not for my kids or they're not for a younger part of me. Um, like all Tarantino films to me, they're talking to the teenager me, you know, love them or hate them. I have to like, click play on the Tarantino film because I know it's going to talk to some part of my teenage brain. That's still, you know, it's still part of me. Um, and so I think the cartoonist is a really approachable um, mass to get into when you think about the psychology of the viewer and uh, what part you want to talk to. And as an artist, it's fun to activate that part of yourself in order to talk to that person, and that part of the viewer. Um, you know, art is an excuse to get in touch with all the children inside of you. You don't have just one child ego state. I think you have a whole spectrum of children inside of you. Um, and they say like, you know, the music, you know, the best music is whatever music was um, coming out when you were a teenager. And I think the same thing for movies, like the best movies are, for me, it was like 1999 for me. And I was like in, what was that, ninth grade or something. And I mean, yeah, they're good movies, you know, like I don't know, what was Princess Monoki, like, uh, I don't know, like, God, I don't know, The Matrix, uh, I think like Waking Life, like Fight Club, Being John Malkovich, uh, just like all these crazy, like Three Kings, all these like crazy, for me at least, these really influential movies. But it's also because I was that age, like those movies attacked perfectly like my brain at that time. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Christian. Um, could you sneak in one more question, um, Ian? Do you have a super hard stop? But uh, Yeah, yeah, let's do one more question. Sure, happy to. 
um and yeah I'll, I'll sneak it in uh so you know this is the the stoa and we're you know we care about philosophy here um and wisdom and montaigne said that philosophy is the most valuable of all arts uh, the art of living well and uh pierre Hado kind of like said the real philosopher uh the ancient philosophers are artists of life in contrast to like academic artists uh philosophers who are like artists of reason um, so I'm curious, what do you think the philosopher in the truest sense of the word, like a lover of wisdom, would fall amongst the, the different uh, artist mass that you uh, presented here? You're asking which one's like kind of most aligned with the philosopher? Yeah. I can't say for sure, but I would maybe have some love for the emissary because the emissary has to continuously negotiate the problems of life, whether it's the life of the artwork or the world that uh, it's created, they're in a constant feedback loop of life dynamically. And they have to either, you know, put, kick things out or accept things to come in and grow things and destroy things in order to maintain the life of the world or of the artwork. And so, you know, philosophy, I guess maybe to say, to say really briefly wisdom, you know, it's about choosing the right problems to put your attention to, I think. Um, it's very hard to, when you find a wise person, you just, um, I met, uh, how do I say, my in-laws, they, they were close to a, uh, a, a Tibetan Rinpoche called Gaelic Rinpoche. He's passed away now, but the first, I only met him twice. And when I shook his hand and he just said a few words to me, like I could sense his immense wisdom because the words were so precise. And I'm gonna share with them, it's more personal, I'm gonna share with them what, what they were here, um, but his words were so precise and uh, you could sense in that precision, in that economy, that he knew exactly what to pay attention to in meeting me. It's really bizarre and eerie feeling. Sometimes you feel that about people where they can just like, I don't know, like laser eye right into you uh, and in one scan, just like understand what the five words to say to you are. And they weren't earth shattering words, they didn't change my life. I'm just saying this anecdote because it had power the, the degree of precision spoke to a certain wisdom that that person emanated. And that had like an earth shaking power at the time. It felt heavy. Um, the room felt heavy. And um, yeah, I think of wisdom as choosing the right problems. And I think of the emissary as someone, someone who's engaged in life has to ne necessarily negotiate with how the world changes, how they themselves change and how people change. And I think that is a constant test and muscle building of where to put attention. And I think uh, that's probably the be best arena for wisdom to emerge. So I would say the emissary. Yeah, that, that answer resonates. Uh, um, cool. Uh, so uh, we'll gently close here. And um, Ian, any uh, parting uh, words or thoughts you'd like to leave us with, perhaps where we can uh, find your work? Uh, yeah, um, you can see my work at ianchang.com. Um, and um, yeah, the anime series that I started, the first episode's out. It's called Life After Bob. Um, hopefully, either later this year or next year, um, it'll, be, it'll be on demand. Um, but right now, if by chance you are an NFT holder of the various NFTs I've released, uh, you can stream it now. Um, and yeah, uh, the last thing I would say is maybe the thing I'm working on uh, currently is really just trying to cultivate an unconscious language. Um, and I think for me as an artist, it's often, it's not taught in art school, unfortunately, but the thing that I've had to relearn as an artist is how to speak the language of the unconscious, because that's the, that is the way I think to grapple with the more interesting and troubling and scary problems of our time and personally um because if they're truly scary and they're truly interesting and they truly grip you like you just don't have the answer in an easy tweet when you just can't write the answer out because if you did if you knew it, it wouldn't be a problem and so you kind of have to you need some other medium you need some other language and your dreams are the way initially i think evolutionarily your dreams are a way of starting the process of groping and facing a problem that you're interested in and so an art is then the cultural prosthetic of doing that out loud um, for the benefit of yourself and other people. And so just to sit, maybe just iterate and just saying this even for myself, like I, I, I'm committed to, as an artist, to trying to speak the language of the unconscious more. Um, I think that's the best way to get at the scary things in life. Beautiful, well said. Uh, and people in the chat were, were talking about a Stoa movie club. So perhaps when your film gets released, you can uh, watch that here. And oh, totally. uh, 
definitely check out uh, Ian's work. Um, and in the book, you can get on Kindle, it's psychoactive. Uh, so Ian, I'll make some closing announcements in a moment, but Ian, thank you so much for coming to the uh, Stoa today. That was an awesome session. Um, and yeah, thanks for inviting me, Peter. And then next up, we have uh, uh, our Viewquake, third Viewquake book club. Uh, and this is like we read books uh, that give a Viewquake that change our, our paradigm. Um, and the next uh, book is The Dictator's Handbook. Uh, so on Sunday, you can check that out. We're going to have a, a dialogue about it. And one of the authors are going to come in next week. Um, so that being said, uh, Ian, everyone, thank you so much for coming to the store today. <laughs>